All right, thanks everybody for coming today and uh, also everybody on Zoom. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing this time. I uh, pretty much can talk about this all day long, but uh, I will restrict myself um, to the time in which I've been allotted. Uh, so I've been pressing plants for a very long time, and of course it started with pressing beautiful flowers because that starts in the very beginning. I think I've talked to many people about pressing plants, and I think all of us know that somewhere in your house there is a book with a leaf in it. Um, <laughs> that is pretty much everybody. We all started with that, and I think that's a great place to start. But I do want to be able to take it a little bit further for those of you who do want to take it further. But there's many different levels in which you can do that. So of course I bring up this beautiful example in front of us today and so some of you might know Gerald uh, Straley. He was the curator at the Van Dusen Gardens and at uh, UBC Botanical Garden and he was also the director of the UBC Herbarium for a very long time and he was probably one of the best pressers I know. Um, he could hold color, he knew what he was doing and this is a great example because often people immediately will ask me about how do you do with bulbs? <laughs> And this is what you do, you cut them in half, right? And so he was really good at knowing how to cut things and how to show the different varieties of the way you should actually press plants and how you actually display them. And again, because he was at Van Dusen, it wasn't just about native plants. It was actually about a lot of garden specimens and also because a lot of those can become escapees, you wanna be following what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. So this is just a beautiful example again of Gerald Straley's work. Just to start off, herbariums. So I didn't know anything about herbarium before I started volunteering. Uh, I was in Oregon when this all started for me and I was at a community college and they had a very small herbarium there. So me and a friend every Friday would just come in and we mount specimens and it was lovely, it was fun, it was relaxing, it was crafty um, and it really got my Friday going. Um, but once I started to really understand the impact of what I was doing, uh, it really blew me away at how these places are all over earth. So again, herbarias are preserved plants, they're algae and fungal diversity, and it's usually a dried reference. It can be also an alcohol. There's lots of different collections out there. And uh, we have basically been doing and having herbariums uh, documenting earth biodiversity for about 450 years now. So quite a long time. And so the first uh, herbarium that really, you know, there's always two, right? Um, and so there's two that kind of take the, 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 the reins on who was first, right? But we do have two places. Uh, and so Cass as a Germany in 1569 uh, started actually the first herbarium. And then right after that was of course in Italy in 1570. The specimen I have in front of you here, if you look at the date on the inset there, it's 1560. So that's some of the earliest specimens that we have. And the reason I like to show this specimen off is because it really shows you we don't know how long these will last. Yeah. As long as they're cared for, they can last a really long time. And they tell us a ton of information, right? And so a lot of this started in the early days because it was about pharmaceuticals. You needed to know what plants you were picking if you were going to be using them for extracts for pharmaceuticals. So of course they needed to have good identifications and you couldn't just go and say, why don't you go get me that, that blue flower with the, the, the leaf that kind of looks like a hand, you know, that's not gonna work when you're talking about medicinals, right? So we really needed to figure out a better way to transfer that information so that you could really see what was going on. And this was a nice way in which to do that. So you press a specimen, you save the identification and the location, and then you're starting to document biodiversity. So some of the numbers are in the world. <laughs> so there is a wonderful woman by the name of Barbara Thayers and she basically tracks all of this. This is her passion in life. Her uh, father worked at herbariums. She's worked at herbariums in New York. Uh, she is now retired, but she's a driving force and she um, runs the herbarium website. So there's actually a place called Index Herbariorum and they track everything in the world in herbariums. And so the herbariums basically has been estimated that we have about 400,000 uh, specimens all over Earth uh, in these different uh, places on Earth, these herbariums. So there's a total of 3,567 herbariums in the world, and the largest one just hit the top was Royal Botanical Garden, which was kind of surprising because it used to be Paris. So obviously Kew Gardens has taken off and gotten a little bit ahead of Paris. So Paris is at 8 million and now Royal Botanical Gardens at 8.1 million. So those are some pretty large collections and some pretty big competition there. So to give you some context in Canada, uh, there are 93 registered herbariums in Canada 
and the largest one is of course the department of agriculture. they're going to want to know what's here in canada. we want to know what grasses are here. we want to know what invasives are here. we want to know what we can eat. and so the department of agriculture has some of the earliest specimens but also the largest specimen database or the largest collection actually in canada the second one is of course at university of montreal but i'm working really hard to catch up to them because i'm in that third spot of the university of british columbia and so uh, i've been working for 20 years trying to get things databased and accession and so i'm getting really close to their number finally um, and then we have the canadian museum of nature which is of course in ottawa that is of course where some beautiful wonderful taxonomous work and they're usually really working hard now on the arctic so they're really documenting the arctic quite well and so there's lots of good resources and new specimens coming from the Arctic to show the changes of global climate change. Then we also have Royal British Columbia Museum with 220. So a lot of people get a little bit confused with Royal British Columbia Museum why the numbers are so low in comparison to ours, but they mainly only have vascular specimens in their collection. So it's actually quite a large comprehensive collection of British Columbia, uh, but they mainly just focus on the vascular specimens. And then I always want everybody to know about the smallest herbarium. I'm not sure if it's in the world, but I think it's definitely the smallest one in Canada, which is, of course, Bruce Bennett in the Yukon. And this is in his basement. And I think actually that number is incorrect. And I think it's actually near 10,000 now. So he has his own registered herbarium in his house. And he just retired last uh, week or two weeks ago. Um, and he actually just got an award for it because he's on iNaturalist. So do follow him. He's an incredible botanist. And uh, give, keep him busy. Uh, any time you want to visit, his door is open. He's amazing. So uh, just a wonderful driving force of the north. Um, and we hope to see more specimens from him. So just to give you some context at UBC Herbarium, so we do have five collections. And so I kind of joke around that we kind of have four plants and one animal. Um, and so seaweeds and algae is one of the collections that I take care of. So the phycological collection. And then I also take care of the flowering plants because I'm lucky and I get to take care of the beautiful flowers. But we also have an amazingly large moss collection of about 360,000. And that's really a lot of that work is based on Will Schofield's work um, with a number reaching 168,000 in his collection number. So that man was a driving force for this collection being as large and as comprehensive as it is. Lots of work that he did was in Haida Gwaii. So a lot of good documentation of mosses from there. And then, of course, we have lichens, which is actually an algae and a fungi put together. And now they're thinking there might actually be a yeast in there as well. So there's a lot of interesting studies going on about what's going on in lichens because they're quite complex and very interesting. And then, of course, we have fungi, fungi which, of course, we all know is now uh, more closely related to animals than plants. So um, just because it comes from the ground and it stays in the ground doesn't mean that it is a plant. So it's kind of fun having animals now in our herbarium. <laughs> so uh, just wanted to let you know why herbariums exist. So there's these time machines. And so I listened to a great talk by David Brownstein. He did the history of John Davidson, uh, the founder of Nature Vancouver. Uh, his thesis is at UBC. And most of the archives are actually imaged. All the images that John Davidson took are actually in the archives at UBC and available for you guys to search. Um, uh, John Davidson was an avid photographer, avid advocate, and an avid collector. And so um, we have some of his earliest specimens. This is a gorgeous one. I will say he does not do pretty specimens. This is the prettiest one I've got. Um, so of course we do have a, a tiger lily here and it's just looking gorgeous as it often does. Um, so our bears are these time machines and what's so cool about them is they basically can hold fruit and flower year round. As we know, anybody who goes out hiking, it's wonderful to see these flowers, but they're short lived. And if you can't actually research and look at these things year round, you kind of have this gap of time where you'd have to wait for the whole season to start again. So this is again a way in which to kind of document, but then be able to actually do research in the winter when things aren't often blooming. Also being able to get a hold of things that are difficult to get a hold of, right? So again, it's this wonderful documentation that can happen and the sharing that can happen with all these herbariums. So the specimen we're looking at is about 103 years old, so it's in great shape. And the specimen holds just a tremendous amount of information about BC and Canada's flora, and also the founder of uh, botany, John Davidson. This is botany John Davidson uh, in his office with his wicked cool mustache that has come back into fashion. And uh, he is, was uh, part of the provincial herbarium and then it actually became part of UBC in 1914 when the war started, right? So it did start in 1912, but it came over to UBC in 1914 and became part of the UBC Botanical Garden and then the UBC Herbarium. 
Um, when I was doing some research for our 100 year anniversary, I was lucky enough to come across this picture in the UBC archives. And it was just very cool because I do love collecting and I love to look at the history of collection. And this was a picture that he took because he loved documenting what he did. And this is a beautiful picture of all of his collection uh, pieces. So all of his field going pieces, right? So the big piece in the very top in the middle that's dark is called a basculum. And so this is kind of like a glorified Ziploc bag is kind of how I talk about it. So it's something you would put on your back and you would carry all of your specimens for the day. And so this is a basculum and it's a nice tin like uh, metal uh, with leather belt. And so you just put it over your back and go out for the day and collect. Um, his press is there, a nice small field going press, and then all of the little bits and pieces, including a hand lens and a little bit of a seed carrier. But what I really got excited about was the specimen that was in this picture, um, because this specimen is 117 years old. And so I went in my collection and there it was, and there it is on the right hand side. So it's in perfectly good shape. It's amazing how long and wonderful these specimens last when they're taken care of. So again, just magnificent to have something that's almost 120 years old looking so delightfully good. So that kind of gets me to what happened with me in this herbarium. So I have been pressing flowers for a long time. I've been volunteering in herbariums for a long time. And then I got a degree at UBC, a master's degree, and I kind of didn't know what to do with myself because, um, sorry to say, but I'm American, and I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to stay in Canada. And so I kind of started working and looking around for jobs and things like that. And um, I went back to kind of volunteering in the herbarium, and lo and behold, they had a job opening. And so I applied and I got it. And it is absolutely the best thing that's ever happened to me <laughs> because it was the right thing. My husband actually says, so I'm a gardener, but I'm not a good one. So my husband actually said when I got the job and he's like, finally, you got a good job where you have to take care of dead plants because you're really <laughs> good at that. And I was like, thanks, hon. Um, but it's true. <laughs> so uh, I do get to take care of dead plants. And so I take care of 250,000 vascular plants on pieces of paper. And we just hit 100,000 in our algae collection. So I'm tracking and imaging and documenting about 200 to 350,000 sheets moving all the time being shared. But during COVID, as many of these kind of projects came about, I was answering a lot of questions on email because I got sent home, couldn't get in my collection. And all these people were emailing me because they're going outside and they're like, this is so cool, this is so wonderful. How do you press a specimen? And I kept typing all these directions on how to, how to press a specimen. And then finally, I just thought, well, shoot, I should just write a book because at this stage, I keep doing it over and over and over again in my email. So why don't I just actually do this? So I approached Royal British Columbia Museum and of course they had a very small window of time because again it was COVID and all kinds of crazy things were happening, including paper. They couldn't get a hold of paper to print books. This was a massive issue actually during COVID. So they gave me four months to write this book, right? <laughs> and so I sat down and wrote this book while also having my full-time job. So I took off a few days a week and would write this book. But honestly, you guys, it had been sitting in there for 20 years. It was ready to come out. And I really, really wanted to encourage people to actually press specimens for lots of different reasons. I did write this to actually encourage people to actually the general public to start collecting and to actually have a backbone on how to do this. But I also want you to know many of the techniques that I use, you can just use in everyday crafts, right? So often when I make a specimen, it doesn't work, right? There's so many factors that can come into play where I'll make a specimen, I think it's going to be great and it ends up not working out well. But I can take some of the leaves off and some of the petals off and then I can make these really nice cards for Christmas or a holiday or a birthday, right? So I often still just take all these pieces and just put them together as a craft, right? Ornaments for your tree, whatever it might be. It's very cheerful and it's very nice and it's a great way to actually just get crafting and going outside and doing specimen work, right? So. This is the book that I was lucky enough to be able to write and it's a little handbook and again it just kind of takes you through the steps. Then you can make these beautiful specimens again like Gerald Straley because nothing is as good as Rosa Nucanensis and, um, and just in case you wanted to, so I do have the book but I also I really want to make this accessible for a lot of people. So I did build two different websites. One I don't like because it's in WordPress and it drives me crazy because I hate the layout. But the other one is also an exhibit that went with the book at the BD. And so that's what this little um, URL here is at the bottom. So if you do want to explore a little bit about how you press specimens through the BD, um, we also built that website as well. 
so because i want this to be an accessible science, um i wanted to make sure that everybody could do pressing specimens. the one thing i really like about pressing specimens is it's a really accessible science you don't have to feel bad, you're not killing any animals, you're not taking any blood, you're just clipping a little piece of a plant off and putting it in a piece of paper and actually documenting history and biodiversity over earth. and that's pretty incredible to be able to just take a little snip of a plant and actually be able to document something so powering so i really wanted people to understand one hardly any of the tools have changed over the 150 130 150 years right it really hasn't changed the tools are really really cheap and it's really great because it gets you outside it gets you noticing things and honestly no we're not going to ever have many people like curators going around or researchers going around to find these things you guys all know it's you who sees these cool things right so i always tell people i want you to go on inat and i want you to take pictures and take pictures of cool things but every once in a while i want you to take a specimen because it's going to be important for the history and the documentation on earth right and we want to start working on that relationship with these really knowledgeable folks who are out there who could really actually help us document this right i don't need to take a specimen all the time but i definitely want you to contact me if you like you find something cool and we have people in the audience who already have donated to the collections donating really cool things right so i know that everybody's out there and you're looking and it's you who's actually going to be able to track this better than anybody else but sometimes we really want to get that specimen rather than just a photo right the one key thing that's really cool about specimens is you can get dna out of them right so a lot of people are like oh a photograph's good enough it often is not good enough because you need to see really microscopic features but also you can't get DNA out of it. And we use so much DNA now for research, especially with hybrids, which are all over British Columbia, right? So we really wanna be documenting this sometimes with uh, a specimen. And you can always contact me if you think you found something cool and I can always help you out in getting those, those documentations correct, okay? So in my book, I did do reusable items and sustainable ideas. I also did a step-by-step -step checklist so everybody felt like they had everything they need when they're going out and doing every single step. And then I also have tips and tricks, so little things that can go wrong and just letting you guys know, it's not you, it's the plant. It happens, right? So hemlocks, <clears throat> those are a classic one. Everybody thinks they're beautiful and then you go and you press them and guess what? Every single needle falls off. <laughs> it's not you, it's the plant, okay? So I wanna make sure that you guys understand how to basically press. So these pictures are offline, and so this is the exhibit that we put together, and so this is in the Beattie. And this is just a quick overview. Again, the details are in the book, but the chapter basically starts off with preparing and collecting. And so these are the tools and supplies. And so we have plastic bags, because you wanna have plastic bags to put the specimens in. And then you're gonna have some secateurs for just clipping, and then possibly a hand trowel or a hori hori. I'm really fond of the Hori Hori. I can do anything I want with it. It's a massive, great tool. You can get it at Lee Valley for about 20, 30 bucks. I love it. I've had it forever. It's awesome. I would get one. Um, Mother's Day's coming up for all you people. <laughs> um, so then we also have preparing to collect. So there's other tools for documenting, right? So you want to make sure you're going to document and record when you're going to actually take a specimen. And so you're going to usually use a waterproof field notebook. I actually know people also just record on their phone now, so that way they can just re-record it back out. Um, they don't want to sit there and write. That's totally fine if you're a walker. Um, wooden pencil, because mechanical pencils don't work in the field, and also you can sharpen wooden pencils. And you always want a ruler and you always want a hand lens, right? So you can look at those microscopic characters and possibly take some measurements before it starts to dry and shrivel up. We often know that when we go to take a specimen, you clip it, but then it'll start to kind of wither away by the time you press it. You really want those good, fresh measurements before you actually start pressing. So the other thing is to also be safe, right? I really want everybody to go out there and have a good time and be and have fun, but always make sure that somebody knows where you are, that you're actually going out with a buddy, that you have yummy snacks and water, and also making sure that you're being careful of what you're actually touching. There are poisonous plants out there that you can have bad reactions to, um, and uh, you just want to just kind of be careful about how you're touching things, possibly putting gloves on, and knowing that there are things, and the big one, of course, if you're in the Okanagan, is a uh, death camus. Um, you don't want to touch that. It, it just, it, it, and the toxins stay for a very long time. Even in our collection, we have it marked so that you don't touch the specimen. So those chemicals will actually last for a while, a while right? Even um, poison oak and poison ivy, the oils will stay on a specimen. So even I can't touch them because then I'll get a rash. So 
they actually do hold it quite well. So I always put gloves on. And then I did a couple YouTube videos again. This was all during COVID and it was just trying to get out people outside and getting them to know what's going on. And I did this one on stinging nettles and um, it became pretty much a hit because I kind of show what happens if you touch stinging nettles. And so it's just kind of neat to see what happens. And, and by the way, it was my son's arm in that video because I told him and I'm like, okay, I'm going to take a video. Don't touch this. And immediately he touched it. And then his whole arm blew up and I was like, yeah, okay, we're going to take a picture now. Um, so yeah, he was really good at that. Um, so then we have the, the, the one that I really wanted to understand when I wrote this book and I had not seen it at any website. There's lots of good websites about collecting. There's lots of interesting books about collecting, but I couldn't find anything that kind of dealt with the indigenous. And I wanted to understand that better, right? I had been told recently that when I go and collect, I need to ask for permission. And I was getting very trapped because I was like, who am I asking? How do I know who to ask? This is very complicated. And so I was really lucky enough to work with Justin and Justin was um, somebody who uh, helped edit this section of my book. And so I do actually tackle this responsible and ethical collection and respecting where you collect. And so he really laid it clear out because we really went back and forth and I said, listen, I want to be respectful and I want to ask when I'm collecting, but I don't know who to ask. I don't want to overwhelm people. I'm not really sure how to go about this. And so he basically gave me a little bit of a layout that I want to make sure everybody else feels comfortable with as well. And so when you are collecting for recreation or study, please do so responsibly. Please do not collect on culturally significant sites. Contact your local indigenous communities if you plan to collect for commercial use. That's a really good three rules to go on at this state and time, right? And so again, I collect for studying. I collect on UBC campus all the time. And so they know that I am collecting, the Musqueam know I'm collecting, but also because it's for study and responsibility and I'm doing it responsibly, I don't have to contact them every single time I collect, right? So it's just, again, being aware and being knowledgeable about where you're collecting and just kind of being a little bit more aware, like if you're gonna do it for commercial use, you're gonna need to contact the indigenous group and get the permit to be okay for that. Um, the other one is also making sure that you're always asking before you collect. There's lots of different places you can collect that you don't necessarily have to ask. Places like Crown Land are those. But when you come to provincial parks and national parks, we really want that documentation and those permits in place. So again, when you go to a park, even though it's really nice to be able to pick flowers because they're there and you see them, please make sure that you get a permit ahead of time because if everybody starts picking the flowers, then there's nothing going to be left for the actual things that need it, which is the insects, the pollinators, and the animals, right? So we want to, when we actually collect, we want to be thinking about that as well. So in chapter two, I talk a little bit about why, what, when, and how. So why are we collecting plants? When, and what are we going to do, and how are we going to do this? And so again, much more comprehension is in the book, but basically an overview of a lot of people collect for different reasons. These are some of the short reasons is documenting biodiversity. It's a big reason on why I do it. Local knowledge, so all of you are local knowledge. You are the keepers of like Vancouver's natural history, right? And we know this. And if you pick a plant, you can tell me a story, right? Many people have picked plants and given me specimens and almost always there's a story behind it. And that's what I absolutely love is these little tiny stories that start coming out on why they grab this plant, why they pick this plant, right? Um, and it happens all the time. So then we also have for teaching. We, of course, want to be teaching people about local plants, what you can use, what you can eat, what you can't eat, um, what's in your garden. And then also just for crafts. So like I always say, whatever doesn't work becomes a beautiful craft, right? And it becomes a beautiful card for somebody. So I just want you to experience the pure joy of pressing a plant and actually just recording history. And so you want to know the three what's. You want to know what to collect. Uh, what plant parts to collect and what information to collect. And so you start off with a theme. So I always tell people when you're first starting off, you kind of just decide, okay, well, if you're going to go and collect something, maybe think about a theme. So I'm going to collect all the spring flowers that I can see, or I'm going to collect um, all the different hybrids that I see. I have a collector who always gets oddballs, as she calls it. So if it is not the right petal count, or the right sepal count or the right stamen count, she'll grab that one. So she just grabs things that are odd and not right, right? Which I think is kind of cool. One of the other ones I really like is I would really like people to start collecting the galls. So the insects that actually attack the plants. We do not have a good collection of the galls that actually are on the plants that attach. So things like that. 
So there's all these different ways where you kind of can pick a theme and then kind of go with it. You can even do your own neighborhood. I'm going to do a collection of my own neighborhood, right? And I'm going to be the keeper of knowledge of my neighborhood. It's kind of amazing what you'll find when you start looking, right? So one of the ideas I've given in the, um, the book is you can do first bloom, last bloom. So the first bloom of the season and then the last one of the same species. And this is kind of interesting when you're looking at global climate change because you can start to see these shifts happening when you see late and early blooms. Hybrid swarms are a big deal in BC, so we really want to be looking at when you think something might be hybridizing, something looks a little strange. It probably is, and we'd like to see a specimen of what that looks like, right? Because we're going to need the DNA to be able to really detect what's going on with hybrids. And then, of course, we're going to be needing to think about invasives, exotics, and introduced. I really like to pick those because I have no guilt. There's no guilt when I pick those, they're just gone, 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 right? I love picking those for crafts as well. So I often tell people just pick invasives like crazy for crafts, right? Like it's, why not? You know, they're great, they're beautiful. And then you can just make all kinds of great crafts out of them and then actually get rid of them in different areas. Um, so when you collect plants, of course, it's what you probably already know is you're going to want to collect certain parts and they're going to be the reproductive parts, right? So you're going to want to collect the fruits and the flowers and the seeds. You can't always do that at once, but you usually want at least one of those reproductive parts. So either the fruit or the flower or the seeds. And you want to include stems and leaves in that overall morphology. So kind of what it looks like, right? And then you want to check your field guide or your local flora because that will actually tell you kind of what you might need to collect or look for when you're actually collecting a specimen. So do you need to collect a basil leaf or do you need to collect uh, uh, um, or do you need to collect something in seed as well as in flower to be able to identify it, right? So a local flora or somewhere online will kind of give you a hint of what you're actually going to be collecting. I often don't tell people you often don't need roots. So a lot of people ask me, do you need to collect roots? I, I, I really don't see that being necessary unless it's an annual. Annuals, we really like to see the roots because we like to make con confirm that it's an annual and not a biennial. And we can do that if we have the whole thing because we can look at old leaf scars, right? So we can kind of see what's going on. But again, often you don't need the roots. And what's great is if you leave the roots and a little bit of leaves at the basil, that means the plant can come back, which of course we want, right? Linda, yes. a, can you tell us the names of the slides because we can't read from here what what like was that a tulip in the last one was that a tell what? Us what the plants are yeah oh this one yeah oh you can't read that oh yeah i can't read it either <laughs> it's a tulipa though yeah it's a it's a tulip and so this is again a gerald straley one right um he was very good um, so yeah, so then uh, the information you want to collect, this is what's on a normally on a label in a collection. And so uh, you go over the scientific species name, you want the location. I always tell people you really need to think about location and you need to think about it in a way you probably never have before. So the first thing is there's tons of my labels that actually say gas station. Okay. okay, so that is not going to be the case in 100 years. We don't even know if people know what gas stations are going to be in 100 years, right? The restaurant at the corner. Many of us make pit stops along the way and we like to pick some flowers, but you really got to think about the fact that none of those places are going to exist in 100, 200, 300 years. So you really need to think about where you are on Earth right and long term and knowing that even earth is constantly changing so this is why we've really been asking people for latitudes and longitudes so using your phone a little bit of a gps so we can really start to figure out where you are on earth because some of these descriptions that we have just will not hold uh, for long-term um, documentation uh, we also want to know the habitat so is it a street corner backyard forested area any associated species that you might see uh, also the collector. We want to know you. We want to know your full name. Many women have gotten lost in time with collections because people just see the last name. They see a famous name and they think it's a man. But actually a lot of the early collectors were of course women and their names have changed over time. So they can get very, very lost in all of this history and documentation. Yet they were some of the earliest collectors we ever had. Right. Uh, you always want the date and I always tell people four numbers for that year because let me tell you when you're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of years putting 23 is not telling you or putting 24 is not telling you which century you're in or decade you're in right so you really need those four numbers and then of course I always want everybody to tell a story so those notes anything interesting about the plant anything interesting on why you collected it what was so cool about it was it the color of the flower was it the location it was collected what was so interesting about it and this is just another little example. So what I like is this is Frank Lomer. Many of you might know him. Um, he makes really interesting collections um, and he makes really good notes. And one of the things I liked about the note on this particular one is it says several plants in one area established for many years, only known site in BC. That's a mark right there 
on when this thing showed up, what it might be, and whether or not it's going to spread. So because of this note, we can now actually start to document since 2008 how far this uh, species has actually ventured out from this one population. So it's a very, very knowledgeable note. Um, he often puts associated species as well, and he makes beautiful, beautiful specimens. He gives me about a thousand a year. So we're almost up to, I think, getting more, like 12,000, I think, in my collection. Um, so yeah, he's an amazing collector. Um, so you want to also think about conservation when you're doing collections. So you want to do, uh, do you see 20 individuals blooming? So not just 20 individuals, but 20 individuals blooming. Remember, this is food for birds and animals. This is food for pollinators. So you want to leave flowers. Even if it's an invasive, you want to leave those soft flowers. And then um, you want to think about disturbing habitat. You don't want to disturb a habitat just to get a plant. It's not worth it, right? You can always take a photo instead. So the one in 20 rule, when not to collect, take a picture. And then you can always contact me if you think it's a, something that we should go back and get a specimen for, right? So chapter two, collecting plants, how to record the collection. So you're gonna do recording the collection information, which I just went over. You're gonna record distinguishing features, anything cool about it. You're gonna assign and record a unique collection number. You're gonna write down preliminary species identification. I'm gonna tell you right now, a lot of people who collect, they don't know what that species is, right? That's okay, we all have to learn, right? So don't think that you're supposed to know the name of everything around you. We have a lot of plants, okay? These are not animals, all right? There's a lot of plants to know their names of. So feel free to gather, um, and you don't always have to have the exact name on it. That's where you can come to my herbarium and use the herbarium to put a name on it, right? Then you put it in a little bag like we did here with the little castilea and we put a little, um, we take it out of the field. We then, uh, this is one of the drawings. I just wanted to make sure that you guys also knew that in the book, we were lucky enough to have uh, Derek Tan do the illustrations and he works with me and we're really close friends. And I was very lucky because we worked back and forth and back and forth. We were only supposed to get 15 uh, illustrations out of him, but we got 26. Mm -hmm. So it's packed, it's like chock full of illustrations in here with lots of good detailed information. Mm -hmm. um, and then here's the little pressing. So a lot of people will ask me about presses, which I'll show you in just a minute. Um, and so this is a little press that I had, and there's lots of different size presses, but honestly, I just, again, want to make sure everybody knows this is about access. So if you have cardboard and you've got a big book in your house, you've got a press, right? So you don't need to have this lattice work. You don't need to have the straps. I do it because I go in the field and because I need it for my field work. But honestly, if you're just going around your, your neighborhood, you can just pick some plants, put it in some cardboard and some newsprint, and then put it under a nice heavy book with some nice dry air and a fan, and you're gonna get a beautiful specimen, right? So it's really just about anything you have in your house will actually work. So pressing and drying your plant, how do you press your plant? So I'm gonna do a little demonstration in just a minute. So I'm gonna skip over this part about the pressing and the drying, or sorry, the pressing, because I'm gonna show you a little how to do that. The other thing I wanted you guys to know is we, um, the whole goal here is to exicate. So it's to actually get the water out of the plant. When you're drawing a plant, whether it's for hobby or anything else, the goal is to get the water out as quickly as possible, but not over cooking it or over drying it. You're not gonna stick them in the oven to try to get that water out, right? That's not gonna work. But you do wanna try to get the water out. So when it's a moist day, a lot of people wait till midday to get the moisture so you don't have to deal with the morning dew. I often take a, a little bit of a paper towel and just dry it off, right, before I actually put it in the press. And then I'll actually switch out the paper in my press. The more water that's in there, the more it's going to turn brown, the more it's going to go wavy. So if you get with pressings, even again if it's in a craft and you get these waves, it's because there's too much water actually also in the air. Humidity can also again reincorporate itself. Remember, you're trying to do cell death. I'm actually trying to kill the cells very quickly, and I don't want them to reabsorb water, right? So that's drying them down so they'll hold their color, but actually not reabsorb water. So it's an actually a, just a topic of just trying to get that, that water out of there. So this is my little setup at home. I literally put a fan, a heater, and my press on the other side. And so that's how I do it at home. I've got my press always uh, going. It's, it's always going right now. And I've had the heater on for the last two weeks, just pressing lots and lots of things that I've been finding. 
but the key thing is you want airflow, you want it to be consistent. You don't turn the heater off at night. This thing is going all 24 hours, okay? So I've got heater and a fan going for 24 hours all the time until these are fully dry. If you turn it off and you turn the heat off, you're gonna have reabsorption and you're gonna get the wave and you're gonna get dark spots everywhere. So you really just gotta try to get that water out of there and keep the air humidity out of there, right? Um, so I usually say you just don't know how long it's going to take, but it's going to take about three to six days. And again, it depends on how thick it is. The weirdest one I had is this year we did an ancient BD box for the, um, for the BD Biodiversity Museum. We have a museum in a box. And so I collected magnolia and ginkgo and equisetum, and I had never collected ginkgo before. It took me six weeks to get that thing to dry. It's very succulent. I never would have thought about it, right? I mean, these beautiful leaves, everybody puts them in jewelry and everything else. I mean, they're absolutely beautiful on cards, but oh my gosh, it was six weeks. I kept opening the press and they were just floppy, right? And that's how I know when they flop, that's when they're not done yet, right? They have to be stiff. Six weeks, right? I've done Opuntia, okay? I went out to the Okanagan and got Opuntia. That thing dried quicker than, than Ginkgo, right? So that was kind of crazy. Um, but anyway, so that was a new lesson for me learned. Um, so yeah, I get to do it again in the summer. <laughs> um, these are the little supplies. Again, you don't have to have specialty items, you know, it's just a little bit of glue. You can use Elmer's glue. I use linen tape because I like the tape, but you can just actually sew on as well. So a lot of people in the world sew the specimens onto the sheet rather than actually taping them and gluing them. It's wicked cool. I love it. I think it's gorgeous. Um, but so anybody who loves needlework, it's absolutely gorgeous when you needle these onto the, the actual sheet. But just a little bit of tweezers, again, a nice little list of uh, different uh, things that you would like when you're actually pressing and mounting the specimen. Again, I'm going to see if I can have some time to actually show you how to mount a specimen and a demonstration. Um, and then when you do the collection, and then you do the pressing, and then you do the mounting, the one thing that everybody forgets to do is you got to freeze it up. So remember, every single flower you gather, there are little tiny eggs in there of little tiny beetles that are so thrilled when they open up that they're just gonna eat all that yummy pollen, right? So <laughs> pollen is just a tremendous food source, right? And so the insects know to do that, so they put all the little eggs in there, and so when the humidity is just right and they hatch, they'll eat the whole thing up. Ranunculus is a classic one. It's got so much pollen, it's really nutritious and it's really water orientated. And so every time I do buttercup, I really have to freeze it up. So I put it in a freezer for a couple of weeks to get rid of those dermestids, right? So those are the ones that really go after your specimens. And I do it every couple of years. So you do have to keep refreezing because things will actually get into that collection. And again, I cover it pretty well actually in my book, but a lot of people don't think about this even with your crafts. So if you do have one of those like old letters where somebody sent a press specimen and it's in a letter or something like that, you're gonna wanna freeze that, right? Because it's just gonna keep degrading over time, right? So identifying your specimen. This is the one thing that everybody gets nervous about. And I just, I always have to put this out there, okay, you guys? So. There are 300,000 plants in the world. That's not considering all the hybrids, all the cultivated things, everything else. Animals have got about 30, 40,000. So if you want to actually learn about names, it's really easy to do animals in comparison to plants. So give yourself a break first off. There's a lot going on in the, in the plant world, right? Um, but we do have lots of good resources now as well, right? And then the Latin part, you know, people always get hung up on the Latin. I never do because I can't pronounce anything anyway, so I just give up and I just figure as long as you and me understand what I'm talking to you about, that's all that matters, right? So it's about communication. So if I pronounce something polystichum unitum or polystichum unitum, they're the same thing, they're just different pronunciations. People will say one's right, people will say one's wrong. All I care is that you know I'm talking about sword burn. That's all I care about, right? And then when you're talking about plants, just remember again, you just wanna make sure you're communicating exactly what you're looking at. This is just a small section of my library. <laughs> I was trying to figure out where I take a picture and I took a quick picture, but yeah, I've got lots of floras. I love floras, I make little notes in them. I use online resources, there's tons. Um, so yeah, you can always contact me if you wanna go through the system of kind of how I use resources because there are so many nowadays, um, but some are more reputable, some are more up-to-date than others, which is why it can get quite confusing. So I did want to leave you guys with some links. Um, so I do have a press plants making an herbarium at the BBM exhibit. I also have a press plants Instagram site. So if you do want to follow on Instagram, all I do is I really show you cool things I find in the collection. 
right? It's not about me, it's about the collection. I really wanted to share what I find. When you find all these cool things, you just feel like this is crazy. I get to find something cool today and I wanna share it with somebody. So it was the way I could actually share. And then we also have a barren fundraising. So I actually have a uh, plan. So I take some of the scans. I've scanned 26 of these specimens, shrunk them down in these high res scans and I fundraise with them. So we have a website for that. And then I also do backyard biodiversity videos. And so I've done about seven or eight of those. And so it's just trying to help you kind of learn some of the plants that might be in your neighborhood. And then the last website is the Citizens of Biodiversity. That one is actually fairly thorough, but again, it's in a program that I don't love. So the layout I don't love, but it is a cool little program that uh, will kind of again, show you how to collect specimens. So we're gonna end there, but it's because I'm gonna move over and have a few minutes to show you a little bit of a demonstration of the actual press and how this kind of works. So we're gonna shift for just a minute. Okay, so you won't be able to see me, but you're able to see my press which is the important parts. So, um, so this is a field going press. Um, and uh, I always tell people, you know, they wonder sometimes why the straps are so long. So um, my press, when I go in the field and I do a big weekend, especially a foray, my press will be about up to my hip. So I will actually press all the way. This press can actually just keep going as long as the straps are, right? And so because I don't have a lot of space, um, I just need to be able to cram everything in here, right? And so um, I actually uh, emit this. Uh, this is a stolen press from the University of Oregon. Um, so they stopped teaching taxonomy a long time ago and I walked into a room and I saw a bunch of presses at the top of this lab and I went, nobody will miss it. So um, you'll actually see stamping here from University of Oregon. <laughs> Uh, but I always tell people I've used it, so it was an okay. Uh, I also always keep paper towels for some blotting and also a little bit of wax paper or parchment paper. So if you're going to do anything sticky, right? So if you're going to do a sundew, if you're going to do something like a bulb, if you're going to do berries, right? You're going to put a little bit on both sides and that way you'll stick them in here. They'll stick to the newsprint when you go to press, right? So you might as well just put it on some parchment paper because it's really important that we get to see all of those bits. And then I always have extra paper. Um, and so right here, I use a little bit of foam. I'm going to show you how to press a specimen. So right here, I've already pre-prepared this little sheet here. And so this is newsprint, because again, we're going to make this available for anybody. I've written down that this is UBC BBM, which is the museum I work with, at the courtyard. And this is on March 13, 2024, and I've given it the number 001. And then I've said it's Acer Circinatum. And so I'm going to take this specimen that I have right here. So you just wrote that right on your newsprint. I write it right on the newsprint. And that way, and this really, what this comes down to you guys is because remember, if Frank Lomer is giving me a thousand things a year, sometimes they're also going to be the exact same species. I need to know which one he's giving me because sometimes these can be really interesting to science. And if we don't really order this out properly and we get the wrong thing, we could completely be in the wrong place when it comes to science, right? So I'm actually doing what a lot of people don't do, which is, of course, a shrub. I really, really love shrubs. Um, I don't think enough people do trees and shrubs. And this particular one is, of course, Acer circinatum. And they have just got the cutest little flowers right now, and most people ignore them, but I just think they're adorable. So I'm actually flipping this guy on his backside. And so a lot of people, again, don't think about that, but I want to see these flowers. So I'm going to flip this over to the backside. And again, I've got this specimen here. I've got a little ticket that says the collection number, it was me, the date that I took it, and then I just put this in here, cover it up. Again, I've got this information on the outside. I take this and I put it on there, but you know what? I might, sometimes I use foam to actually balance things out. So sometimes I'll put foam in there and I just squish it, right? This is all I'm going to do is just try to get cell death, I'm trying to get it to relax, right? And so that's really what it's about is trying to get it to relax because once I can get it to relax, I can kind of start to see what it's going to do. And in this case, you can always tell like it's going to bend, it's going to, going to do certain things, right? So you can always decide if you want to flip it. Um, one of the other examples I have in here, which I wanted to bring to you guys, because again, a lot of people, and I mean a lot of people don't collect these, it's conifers, yeah. all right? So nobody collects conifers anymore, you guys. I just went through my cone collection. I haven't seen anything in my collection since the 60s. All right, so this is a long time. But we have very interesting species here. We really need, we need this stuff for DNA, right? But this I really liked because again, you got the boys, 
beautiful boys here and you've got these beautiful immature girls right yeah and so they're all ready to go right mm -hmm. and it's just it's really fun to me and these are actually satisfying because the needles will stay on Oof. Mm -hmm. hemlocks will not oh, give oh, up on hemlocks that's it ain't gonna happen oh, yeah so this is a dougie right mm -hmm. so that's a dougie and it's, it's it'll hold on to most of its needles right some of them will fall off right but a lot of people don't actually collect the actual boys they think a lot about girls i always talk about that we think about the flowers and we think about the fruits right but we don't think about actually collecting the the boys in all of this right because they go so quick and they're just covering our car with all that pollen and we just don't <laughs> like it uh, but really start collecting conifers and start collecting shrubs right and this is all I do. Is so you just put a single piece of newspaper. Just, yeah, just a single, single piece of newspaper. Of and then this is blotter paper. I love blotter paper. This stuff lasts forever. Um, use this instead of newsprint. Oh, sorry, instead of paper towels. So a lot of people use paper towels, but it will make an imprint, right? Mm -hmm. So this is why I like the blotter paper. Is it doesn't leave that imprint. Is it easy to find? It's, yeah. it's easy to find. It's a bit expensive, but yeah, it la right? like this stuff lasts forever. So you so can just reuse the same piece all, of paper over and over and over and over. This stuff. Oh, yeah. Fashion paper. Old fashioned blotting and paper. Where do you it's, buy it? Uh, I buy it at their Barham Supply Company, but honestly, you can get it on Amazon anywhere. Because of crafting, blotter paper has come back big time because mm -hmm. so many people are pressing flowers and things mm -hmm. and making cards. Mm -hmm. So, blotter paper has come back. But honestly, you guys, this stuff is like 30 years old. It lasts forever, right? It's really good. And it's really good when you're doing wet stuff. Like, if you're going to do a skunk cabbage, you're going to need a lot of blotter paper. That's a very wet plant, it's very succulenty, right? So I do want to encourage people to start collecting conifers and collecting shrubs because I think people get nervous about them and you shouldn't be. Um, but again, like anytime, and you know, there's even- but the leaves on that will be all wrinkly, right? They will be wrinkly. And so this is what I like to work on is if you want to do it for crafts, you want to get it flat. You're going to get it off of this and you're gonna just pick them off so they'll go flat. And you'll do the press that's got the four screws on the side, and again with blotter paper, and that will make these completely flat, mm -hmm. right? But with me, because I need all this structure, it's, yeah. it's always going to be a fight between the leaves, the flowers, and the stems, right? Which is why people don't like to do shrubs, is because it's kind of dissatisfying, right? You don't get that beautiful, picturesque, but that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the scientific aspect, because I'm gonna tell you guys right now, there are things that are gonna go extinct in our lifetimes, right? Yes. I mean, I think big leaf maple is going bye-bye quick. Okay, mm -hmm. that thing is getting, it's really starting to struggle. We're getting these dry. Watch the, watch the fungal infections that come in. Last year, there were so many fungal infections on the leaves, they couldn't photosynthesize, I think, at the level that they're used to, right? So I'm really getting curious, and they're seeing this in Oregon, right, where we're already starting to lose populations, right? It's a really restrictive range. When you look at it, it's a very small range, right? So these are the kind of things I'm kind of interested in is kind of what's happening here, right? So again, you don't even have to have blotter paper. You don't have to, this is what's so amazing. You can just lay it out. Like often I'll just lay out something like that and then, you know, press it down and then just put my, and then just get it to relax. And I'll usually check it in a couple days after it's been under the dryer and I'll try to rearrange it a little bit. I'll see if it's behaving. I'll see if anything's going wrong. I'll see if a, if a leaf or a flower flipped in the wrong way that I don't like, you know? So this is the kind of thing you do, and you just start to get it to calm down, right? So sometimes with no paint. Sometimes, sometimes you, yeah. So so you dub actually. Do they do these forays? And one year they decided to not go with paper. So all they did is they they put the little tickets on there, right? Oh, I got a bug in here. You always have bugs too. But um, yeah, they'll just put a little ticket on there, and then just use the cardboard or blotter paper. Because newsprint is hard to get a hold of. It's actually not as absorbent as it used to be. It's not I as use, good. I've mm -hmm. got some old phone books which I've kept. Yeah, they're great for pressing. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I press leaves in them. Yep, no, they're so good for pressing, right? So yeah, so this is why it's a really accessible, easygoing science in my book, and this is why I really like it, is because anybody can do this as science, but you can actually really start helping scientists track biodiversity, right? If you're just doing four leaves, um, is there a technique for getting better color retention? pulling that water out. So yeah. really getting like, uh, using paper towels or something really absorbent, yeah. and then um, getting something really absorbent to really get that water out quickly. That's yeah. really what the color is about, right? So once you have your specimen, so like this one is a ribes from last year. So you can already see like it, the color starts to fade a little bit. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I didn't uh, store this one very well, right? It was stored in a really moist area. But this is a ribes that I collected last year. Um, I like to collect for lots of different activities. And so if you're going to go mount the specimen, you know, I've got my label, put it in the corner, I've got my specimen, 
I usually like to flip it around a little bit and see who likes to lay down properly in a nice way. And then a lot of people don't think about it, but you can actually put these upside down, right? So you can actually have them hanging as well. This is a little fragment packet that'll also do for mount teams. So let's say I wanna do some DNA. If I take one of these leaves, I can put it in here and this will be DNA for a researcher. And that way they don't have to destroy well, my then specimen. then you can keep it with the specimen. Yep, so then we put it with the specimen and we put the number on there and we glue it here. We put the number here that's gonna go here. And that way they don't tear apart my specimen over the hundreds of years. They'll just mm. take some out of that packet instead, right? Which I really like. Mm. Um, and then honestly, all I do when I mount a specimen, take a little bit, take a little bit of glue. My glue has been misbehaving, it's so, so funny. is that special glue or just regular white glue? So this is Elmer's glue. And you can use Elmo's glue. And this is the thing, it's about two different things. If it's for you, Elmer's glue is fine, non-archival is fine. But if it's for me, I use archival glue. Archival glue um, doesn't have as much sugar, uh, so you don't have as many insects that go after it. It also doesn't react. It'll start to react to the plant sometimes. It also stretches. So the really weird thing that I didn't know about herbarium stuff when I first started is that this paper is taken in water and this is taken in water, always but they're stretching at different humidities. Mm. This is not this. So if they're completely glued down, over time they'll start to crack because the actual paper is expanding and the specimen's expanding and they're expanding at different rates and the old glue didn't have that give. Mm -hmm. Where now the glue that we use has give and so we won't have that cracking, right? And so that's kind of how you use that. And honestly, my glue bottle is just not working, but I'll usually just dab some glue on the back here so I'll just kind of pretend I'm dabbing my glue here just a little bit. I turn it over. I take some of these linen papers. So this is again for like book binding. It's linen tape, it's archival. And I don't usually lick, <laughs> all right? I've got a little sponge that I use. And I just, and this is where people sew. So instead of doing this, you'd sew this part on, mm -hmm. right? And so it's that quick. I'm sorry about my licking. <laughs> but, you know, I usually have a little sponge. And then you just start to hold them down and you hold them down tight. And honestly, like it's kind of amazing how quick they just start to lay down and do their thing. And so this is all I do is just mount the specimen, put a label on there, and I've done science for the day. <laughs> and that is a great way to do science. Just like that, right? And then I would just put them on, put the little fragment packet on, have a little label here saying everything about that I could do. The other thing I do want to point out is I am, again, I'm trying to add the territory. So I, I gather on UBC campus, and so instead of just saying UBC campus, I'm actually starting to put Musqueam territory, right? Because I'm trying to get it so it's a searchable function, so again, we can start thinking about what land is this really that we're collecting on? Oh, yeah, I know. It's so funny. <laughs> it's not behaving at all, right? So we've got this specimen. Let's say I've mounted it all. And this is what I was saying is once it's all mounted and ready to go, I then just put it Here into... Want, I know. Want. Yes, thank you. You're so good. So I just take the specimen and I'll just put it in what's called a species folder. Right? Again, you can just do this at home. You can actually get supplies from me. I have lots of extra. And then I put it in a genus folder. And then I put it in some cardboard. And then, like I said, I then put it through the freezer. So you don't have to do what I do, but this is just the linen cotton tape. Just again, librarians and us have lots of crossover. And so this is just the linen tape that librarians use. And this is actually, you guys, I'm going to show you if. I was shipping this, this is exactly how I ship all over the world. Every single specimen I do, I ship like this. And I was amazed that this is how this works. But honestly, once you do this and you get it nice and tight, you can ship it anywhere in the world. And I have lots of regulations that I have to follow when I ship things. And just so you guys know, if you're ever traveling in the world, don't ever collect a cactus and don't ever collect an orchid because it's actually very difficult to move those two items across the world. They're actually CITES listed. Mm -hmm. So that whole family, both of those families are actually CITES listed. So I do that. I put my specimen in there. And then I put it in a little garbage bag or a little bag. And then remember, I put it in a freezer, right? So you want to freeze this because otherwise you're going to get very disappointed in a year when the bugs start to eat it all up. And I just put it in a bag, and then I'll put it in a freezer. And again, your home freezer is just fine. Just leave it in there for like a couple of weeks, and you just wrap it up. 
And here's the big key, put it in there for two weeks. It'll kill off most of the bugs, right? So that's great. But then when it comes out, leave it in the bag for 24 hours. A lot of people, when they take it out of the freezer, they take it out of the bag. The whole point is if there's moisture, there's beetles. If there's moisture, there's insects. It's the moisture that's the issue, right? It's always the moisture with all of these things. Even in storage, I store in the basement, it's so bad. It's so much moisture in my basement, right? So like that's the thing, wherever there's moisture, that's not where they should be stored, right? But this is basically the stages. So you're just gonna go out and you're gonna collect, you're gonna get your permits, you're gonna think about collecting, you're gonna press your spant, you're gonna put some documentation, you might take some pictures, and you'll come home, you'll make a beautiful mounting, whatever didn't work, you're gonna make into a beautiful card or a craft, and then you're gonna freeze this, and then hopefully, if it's a good specimen, you're gonna bring it to me, and you're gonna be famous, <laughs> and you're gonna be in my collection, and you're gonna be online and everything else, right? Because that's what I really want, is I want all of you guys to be in my database collecting, right? So yeah. So that's kind of the way we do it. I did want to show you, because this is amazing. So I make these little cards with leftovers, right? So I'm not sure if we can see that. So these are some of my leftovers, right? So I had a bunch of leftovers, and I had a bunch of my volunteers um, make cards on the last day when they were mounting. I don't know if you can see this. This is Martin Henry. He is just this amazing artist. This is cedar, cherry blossoms, uh, carrot and rabies, uh -huh. and then he just colored all around them. Um, they're just beautiful, right? And this is the kind of this is the kind of joy I get, right? I mean, we walk by cedar all the time, rabies all the time. You've never seen it like this before, right? So, anyways, there's lots of beautiful crafts you can do, and honestly, just this is this guy. What's his name? Everybody loves him. Oh, botanical design, coastal presence. He makes beautiful algae. So I think Bridget was here just recently, right? Mm -hmm. So she's the other one I, I want, anyways. We've been talking a lot about this guy, but he makes just amazing pressings. And honestly, you guys, if you get into pressing plants, like vascular plants, you've got to do algae because it is, there's nothing more beautiful. I mean, they're just gorgeous. Is, is this a photo? Or, this is a photo, or, or... yeah, this is a photo. I know, his stuff is amazing. He's on the island, but he's just incredible, right? So he's just another one I absolutely love. But I just love it when people use this in a creative way, and again, um, just absolutely beautiful way of documenting biodiversity, right? And there's a woman in Victoria with a seaweed. I wonder if it's this. I thought it was a guy, but is it this one? Because oh. I can't, I don't know. Somebody gave this to me as a gift, right? And I just, I, it's astoundingly beautiful. But I love algae, right? So that's another one. Like we should get Bridget back here and she should teach us how to do cool algae. Yeah, yeah, she was talking, she, when she did her she yeah. did a field trip at the beach, yeah. and she was talking about some of the algae in our are They're so, because there's like, yeah. so much water in like a kelp bowl. Yeah. Or yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <It's like, laughs> yeah, it's really difficult. And you have to rinse them and everything else. But some of them that you float, they're absolutely beautiful. So instead you float the algae and you take the paper and you put it underneath and you lift it. So you don't glue it. The actual stickiness of the algae just sticks mm -hmm. onto the paper. But it's porphyra that absolutely has these beautiful colors of blues and greens and purples and reds all in one like blade. They're just gorgeous. And right? probably, yeah, you'd have to float it because it's it's only one cell thick. Like you couldn't yeah, you can't, pick it you up can't and try to it. spread it out. But mm -hmm. if you yep. float it and then put the paper. And this is the thing, like when you do this, you're smashing it. Like it does like people get kind of dissatisfied when they look at it because you're like, oh, it's not as pretty as I thought, right? But algae, absolutely just spot on beautiful, right? Just absolutely gorgeous. So yes, I want to encourage that as well, right? But I told Bridget she has to write the book. <laughs> but yeah, I just anyways, I hope everybody can kind of think about again, use INAT, take lots of pictures. But if you see something cool, you guys are actually the people who know BC the best. And you really should just contact me if you see something cool or something neat or something you just are wondering about, because I love hearing about those. And sometimes, as we know, they, we nail on something very interesting, right? I mean, again, like people, again, sitting in this room have given us specimens that I think will end up really helping research, right? But so the herbarium doesn't keep, like, photos submitted with, like, if somebody said, here's, a, here's, the, here's the pressing of this planet, here's a photo of it. You don't keep photos with We sometimes do. Uh, depending. So like uh, Sandra Lindstrom gave us a type specimen, which that means it's the defining specimen for that species. And we actually kept the pictures because it's called the golden V kelp. The golden V part from, a, uh, it's a, found in Alaska and it was only found in the last 10 years, but the V part doesn't show up very well in the pressings, but it shows up really well on the pictures. 
So we did decide to keep some of those pictures so that you could really see what it looked like underwater, right? Because again, it just doesn't translate. Like orchids is a big one. A lot of people want pictures of orchids because those colors change almost immediately when you dry them, right? Mm -hmm. So having some of those pictures and documentation, we actually will take. Yeah. No, this is great. Wow. Yay. Interesting. <laughs> so, cool. Interesting. so yeah, so anyway, so that was the thing is, that's why I wrote the book is because I, and again, you guys, like Derek did all these amazing illustrations. Mm -hmm. He really tried to make sure that he was clear about what was needed. And I just think the kind of things that are coming out of pressing plants uh, are just astounding. So I would just love to encourage people to do that more. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I have no idea what time it is. I hope it's okay. It's about quarter okay. to nine. Not no. too bad. Great. Not too bad. Yay. So now, <laughs> question period. Yes. All right. Will you do questions? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You should freeze on. So what does it bury up? Uh, um, what was it, 200,000 specimens? Mm -hmm. Are they being frozen every two years? So we froze them when we moved over. So that was about 12 years ago. We've had three outbreaks. So we've had to freeze up quite a lot of the cabinets. And then we have insect traps that we check certain ones. Now, there's certain families I always check. Malviaceae, which is a big one. Again, it's a ton of pollen on Malviaceae. So again, Sedalcia has got lots of pollen. Uh, Ranunculus, lots of pollen. Roses, lots of pollen. Those are the ones that get attacked the most, is the ones that have tons of pollen, right? So those are the ones I check the most. But things like grasses, Bugs are like, nah, nobody yeah. likes a grass. <laughs> haven't found anybody yet who likes a grass. Um, but yeah, so like conifers, I don't worry about, things like that, right? Mm -hmm. Algae's really cool because I never have to worry about algae, basically, right? There's a really weird fungus that attacks algae. That's the weird thing about algae. And it takes off in a cabinet, and you can't do anything about it. So that's a weirdo one. Yeah. So Linda, somebody, yes. uh, Lisa asked uh, four minutes ago, where I, maybe you already answered this, uh, is pressing algae the same as pressing vascular plants? Yeah, it's, it's not quite. And so that's the thing is, one, you have to deal with salt water. So you need to actually rinse an algae uh, before you press it because it'll just show up with all these uh, like crystals everywhere, right? Oh, hi. Uh, I wasn't sure I am. And then um, also, again, like some of them you have to float. They're so thin, you would really have to float it to, um, to have it actually show it's all of its characters. But like if you're dealing with bulk health, like a lot of people ask me, like, do you have a full bulk health, right? And I do, right? But it is 10 sheets, right? So you have to cut it up, right? And you have to deal with the bulbousness of it, right? So when you lay it out, you don't really press it. You just kind of have it on the sheets and you kind of attach it and you kind of have to cut them up. So even this bee kelp that I was talking about that Sandra Lindstrom found up in Alaska, it's in four pieces, right? When you deal with palms, Again, it's in pieces, right? So because palm trees are so big, a lot of people ask me as well, like, okay, so do you take the whole palm leaf? Like, let's think about that. That can be really large, but if you think about it, if you only take, usually, in most cases, if you take half of me, you've got the mirror image, right? Mm -hmm. We're almost always symmetrical. So again, people who do with palms, they usually cut them down the middle and only keep one half because it's just so much space to keep both halves, right? Um, so that's kind of the way they deal with that. But algae is quite different, and this is why I'm really encouraging Bridget <laughs> that I really want to work with her and try to make a website on how to collect algae. Um, I, could I ask a question? Um, to do is speak up so everybody can yeah, um, online can hear. Okay. Um, I'm formulating the question, but it's to do with uh, conifers mm -hmm. um, and say. Uh, Western red cedar, the the cone, both male and female cones are quite fat. Yeah. How do you dry that? So they dry on their own pretty well. I mean, I will say cedar is a very satisfying press because the cones are quite small in comparison to other cones, right? Yeah. Um, and so, and they also don't fall apart. Like ABs can be very uh, they fall apart, right? That's what they're supposed to do. Yeah. And so remember, this is also like when you're pressing plants, you're sometimes against what the plant needs to do. Uh, the plant knows when it's dying, so it's going to try to disperse its seed or it's going to try to go to fruit, 
right? So when it comes to conifers, the um, like right now I'm actually pressing cedars because the girls are just beginning to develop and they're green. And I want to show Red the cedars. green girls and then the the old the, the previous girls from a year and a half ago right. are brown and open. Yeah. And yeah. so then I like to show that this is how much growth happened because now you know how much growth happened in a year and a half, right? right? Yeah. And so you have the girls and the boys and then the other girls, right? So I really like that combo. But they honestly, they dry pretty well on their own. Just takes a little bit of time. Ginkgo has definitely been the hardest so far. Yes. How important is it to, to uh, not have different specimens on the same uh, uh, sheet? That's pretty important. Yeah. And especially nowadays. So if you're talking about like a lot of people also ask me, so when you go out into to collect and this is really getting into the nuts and bolts of science. If you go and collect, so let's say I'm here in uh, Buttercup, let's say Buttercup is surrounding me, and I'll take a couple of specimens from this population. I'm going to call this a population, and I'll take a couple of specimens so I have representation and a few flowers and a few leaves to mess with, right? But then if I see a population over there, and if I feel like it's a different habitat or there might not be a lot of contact, I will give that a new number and I will put that on a new sheet, and I'm going to consider them two different populations. This is also really important for variation. You might be in a place, and again, looking at those hybrid zones, I might see a parent over here and another parent over here, and then I think I see a hybrid right in between. I'm going to put those on three different sheets, but I am going to make a really cool note in my notebook and make sure it gets on the label that all three of these, the parent, the parent, and the hybrid, kind of go together as a story, right? So that's why it's really important to document what you're seeing, because once it's picked, nobody can kind of go back and see that again, right? Um, Alec and Lisa ask about lichens. Any special tips? Oh, <laughs> lichens. Oh, lichens are so cool. Um, lichens are cool and they're tough, right? So um, you're going to do it on the microhabitat. So this is similar to mosses. Um, so lichens, you need to know what it's growing on. That's often what they need to know is what the host, right? So they need to really know about the environment when you're collecting a lichen. So you're not going to scrape a lichen off of a rock. You're going to take a chunk of the rock. You're not going to scrape it off of a, a stem. You're going to take a chunk of that stem and you're going to hopefully say what environment was in and what the host was. This is again, really important also for fungal um, uh, uh, pathology, right? So again, when you're talking about funguses, they often want to know what host. Right, so who's the host for that fungi? Because that's going to tell you who the fungi ID is, right? Um, lichens are just really tough to identify. You have to deal with a lot of chemicals, and that's the part I don't love. Is there's a lot of chemicals in identification because you'll give it like you put bleach on it, and it'll change a certain color, and that'll tell you some things, right? But there's some chemicals you got to use to actually identify lichens. But a lichen that's on a rock, like. You're mounting that mm -hmm. on a herbarium sheet? No, you put it in a box. In a box. Yeah, so same with coralline algae. So I take care of coralline algae, which is really similar. You take the little bit of rock and then you put it in a box. Yeah, so I have a lot of boxes. Uh, Sheila asked, uh, uh, I assume that archival paper envelopes are made of archival paper when mounting specimens yes so archival paper for us is hundred percent cotton rag paper so again it's hundred percent cotton it's actually i also buy one that's buffered a little bit so that it doesn't react to the plant so it doesn't have acidity with the plant and react but it's the cotton it's 100 percent cotton so regular paper you can use it but it does have sulfates and that's kind of acidic and it will start to react to the plant over time. If you want to make a collection that's going to last hundreds of years, 500 years, you're going to want to use archival material and you can come to me for those supplies, right? The, I, if you, especially if you're going to donate, you can get the supplies for me, right? Because I want you to donate and I don't want you to have this be an expense in your pocket, right? But if you just want to do it for a craft, you're not worried about it lasting hundreds of years. Use any paper you want, right? Um, and use Elmer's glue. That is completely fine, right? But yeah, it's that 100% rag paper you're looking for. It's hard to find and it's expensive. So, so if we submitted samples that were on uh, lower grade paper, would you remount them? Yes. Yep. I would want to pop them off if I could. So that's often why I use the linen tape. Linen tape's really nice because I can just cut it and pop it right off. If you completely glue something on, I then cut around the whole specimen and I gotta have this yucky paper and then I put it on good paper. So I have ways to get rid of the, the bad paper so that again, because it's also gonna react to the other specimens in the cabinet. And that's what I'm trying to avoid it. It's not just the specimen it's on, but it's also touching another specimen nearby. So that acidity will start to kind of transfer. 
so we're really about trying to keep as much archival which is funny because in the good old days and i mean hundreds of years ago it was all cotton paper <laughs> right it was all good paper and then we went to the sulfate paper and now we're going back to the good paper right? so i just wanted to add there being the yes. person that uh, donates <laughs> and, uh, yes. and also mounts so you can donate your plants yes. to be pressed in yep. newspaper. You do not need to mount them. Nope. Just, you're happy to have good Absolutely. press specimens. I've got 30 volunteers plus who love mounting specimens on a Wednesday, right? I'm, I'm getting overloaded with people who want to do this, which is great. But they do. It's just a wonderful craft. A lot of the students are stressed out. It's wonderful. They sit in this room. They talk about politics and all kinds of crazy things, right? And, and classes and this on TikTok and all the rest. But they're just mounting while they're doing it. So, so you just need to submit the specimen with a sheet of yeah. paper that has all that information yeah. on it. Yeah, so I'll give you an Excel spreadsheet. You can just type it out. I'll make the label for you. I'll template the whole thing. I'll mount the specimen. So I just really want that specimen clearly in some sort of newsprint to come to me and then to have an Excel spreadsheet that you would fill out. And then I'll do the rest. Yeah. Does the advice on freezing apply to algae? So algae you don't necessarily need to, but here's the deal. Um, silverfish love glue. So if you're mounting and you have glue, which you're going to for the label, they're going to go after the glue. So what I often tell people is the algae isn't going to get carpet beetles and cigar beetles. Those are the two that really attack our collection. But they will um, get things like silverfish, especially again if you're storing it in a, in a, a kind of wet environment, like if you're in a, a basement apartment in Vancouver, that's always moist. Um, and then um, also the paper. There are certain insects that love the paper itself, right? So again, you're kind of, again, maintaining it over time just to try to keep them from actually attacking the specimens. Also molds. You know, molds will start to set in fungal molds on the paper. Mm. So it's really about not just keeping the specimen happy, but also the paper and then the glue and everything else that kind of makes that specimen whole, right? So you will want to freeze it. You just don't have to do it as much. What's weird with fungi is it, it, it can handle freezing. If you think about how fungi are, they're pretty hardcore. So actually you have to heat them. <laughs> so they have a, like a superheat where you superheat them instead, instead of freezing them. And Lisa asks, uh, how do you... How do you press a parasitic plant like a daughter, for example, cascuta? Because they interact with their whole cell and they are vine like. How will you cut it and will you cut it with the host? Yeah, so the big one that I run across all the time is um, Indian paintbrush, so Castilea. So that one is also parasitic, right? And so everybody loves the colors, right? Everybody loves the shades and the colors that that happens, but as soon as you pick it, it is parasitic, usually to a grass. So that's what's really interesting about that one. And as soon as you pick it, it just goes, right? It just flops right over. There's no energy in it. It's getting all of its energy from the grass next to it. So as soon as you pick it, you have to press it, right? That's the only way you're going to get a good one of those is you got to press it right there in the field. And then I usually make a note of the grass that's nearby. I won't necessarily pick the grass with it, but I will call it an associated species because I do know, again, that it's parasitic on that, right? Um, you know the orbex, the big, the big cone ones, right? So those are really cool when those come in, the scrofularies. And those are really cool because those will come in and people say, well, how do you dry it? And I'm like, you don't, you put it in a box, right? So again, it's like a cone, you just put it like in a box. Ground cone. Yeah, the ground cones, yeah, you just put them in a box, right? Because they're, you don't want to smash them, you don't want to cut them in half, right? Um, so yeah, so that's kind of how you deal with big, bulky, weirdo things like that. But in the particular case of, uh, of a daughter, I, I, mm -hmm. I guess you would include the, the, the stem that it's uh, attached to. Yes, yes, you would. I have a question. Yes. Um, you mentioned getting, and maybe this is in the book, you mentioned getting permission if you're collecting in parks. Yeah. So I have two questions. One is, how easy is it for a lay person to get permission to say, I'm an interested field collector? Feel naturalist, right. you know, I'm pressing plants, um, unless you can say that you're associated with a herbarium or something. Would, will you be able to get permission? And where would you ask? Like, is there one place that you would ask for all the provincial parks in BC, or do you need to write to the to some contact the particular provincial park or ecological reserve warden or whatever to mm -hmm. get permission? 
Well, Bev is actually incredibly good at that, right? Um, so I will say she's been a great resource for me. And so just in case you guys didn't know, but Bev was actually one of my editors, right? And I actually really leaned on her on the permit part. I know that sounds crazy, but I actually have never really gotten a permit in BC because I tend to collect everywhere else, right? But from my understanding, it can be a little bit time consuming to get the permit. You need to give yourself a good six months in advance. And it's just to let them get through the paperwork, right? So be thinking about what you want to be collecting. And I do believe that you need to do each individual park. I don't think you could get a blanket one. And Bev, you can correct me. But is there one, one blanket location that you can go to get a permission to collect in a park? Or do you have, is there, do you, are there 150 different locations that you have to contact? depending on which park it is. Did you want to speak on that a little bit, Beth? I mean, I could really briefly. Yeah. You can get a five-year research permit through Front Counter BC, yeah. and that takes six months right. Right. or more. Yeah. And if you want a particular park, I would go to the regional director or the area supervisor for that park. And what you are asking for is a letter of authorization and that would be like to collect a limited number of plants not endangered not oh, red yeah. or blue listed yeah. yellow listed and the thing that i found is that the, 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 the resources are limited for them to um, be going through these permits but honestly when you call them as usual like everybody's so helpful and nice like this is every time I got myself confused because there are a few times. So we're we're collecting a rare plant, Biden's emplysma, right now. So that is definitely a hot ticket, and so we really had to be careful about the permits. And honestly, we got very confused about one site, and so all we did is call them, and they completely clarified everything. It was so lovely because I just you know you you want to do the right thing, and then you're worried you're bugging them, and they're like, no, ask questions, we can help, right? And so as long as you can get a hold of somebody. Um, again, they have limited time and resources, but it's really good for documentation because they need to know who's going in and out of there and what they're collecting. Right? Yeah. So we've run out of questions. Uh, okay. There are many thanks from Natasha Bush and Kim oh, Brown Natasha, and yes. Lisa and others. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Thank so, you. Well, it's nine o'clock, so uh, we we could. Uh, oh, one more message. Thank you from Kim Brown. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, well, I honestly uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak and being here and everything else and also being online. Um, it's I can't I can't I just love pressing plants and I just want people to do it. So yeah, anytime. And honestly, if anybody even online, if anybody has a question about something cool or interesting, please just contact me. I might not get back to you in 24 hours, but I will get back to you um, because I love these stories and I would love people to start collecting. You guys are the eyes and ears of BC, so we need more collections. <laughs> Yay! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.